The distances of the stars are of a special interest to Andrew Murray. Andrew, welcome to our celebration programme. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, your cricket field sequence certainly shows the way we measure the distances to the stars. As the Earth goes around the Sun, so the stars appear to reflect that motion, the nearer stars moving slightly more than the more distant ones. In addition to that, the stars have their own proper motion, which is a straight drift across the sky. So if you look at your screen, you will see the red star uh, has quite a large wobble on its drift, and the yellow star, which is represents a star further away, has a slightly smaller wobble, and the other stars, we can't see the wobble at all. We can measure the distances of the stars by mapping these wobbles very accurately. In the past, we've been able to do it for about a few thousand stars from the ground, but when the European Space Agency satellite Hipparchus is launched in a year or two's time, then we will be able to map the sky very accurately uh, for about 100,000 stars and measure their distances and motions. The technique adopted is for the satellite, which has two fields of view, one there and one there, will spin so that successively the stars appear in the two fields of view and we will scan the sky in circles which gradually move across the sky so that we cover the sky many times in a two and a half year mission and thus build up a very accurate map of the star positions and their movements. And we look forward very much to your coming and telling us about it in our sky at night in the near future. Thank you, Patrick. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The old stargazers could only study the stars in one way and that was to look at them and pick up their visible light. But nowadays, we have a different option. Who hasn't heard of the great 250-foot dish at Jodrell Bank near Manchester, also, incidentally, celebrating its 30th birthday this year? But for the faith, energy and courage of one man, Sir Bernard Lovell, it wouldn't have been built. In fact, it came into action just at the start of the Space Age, which, from Sir Bernard's point of view, was just as well, because the project had run into difficulties. We still had to find the money. I mean, by that time, uh, the bill for the telescope, which, for which I had only got a third of a million, had gone up to £680,000. We, we collected uh, £100,000 fairly quickly, and then we were stuck for the remaining uh, sixty or fifty or £60,000. By this time, it was 1960, and we were uh, part of the... A ground network of the American space effort. We had carried, uh, come to this arrangement with, with great secrecy with the, what was then the United States Air Force. And Pioneer 5, the first series of Pioneer 5s, we uh, had the job of actually not tracking it, but actually commanding it uh, from this telescope. We sent out transmitted signals, uh, which about 20 minutes after it was launched from Cape Kennedy, the, uh, we released the uh, space probe from its carrier rocket. And, of course, this was uh, all over the newspapers, front page news. The next day, the telephone rang. The other end, the man said, oh, is that Lovell? Yes. My name is Tlingerly. I'm Lord Nuffield's secretary. His lordship wishes to speak to you. So Lord Nuffield came on the phone. Is that Lovell? Yes, my lord. How much money is owing on that telescope of yours? Oh, I think about 50,000 miles. Is that all? I'll send you a check. So I said, oh, that's absolutely fine. It's all right, my boy. You haven't done too badly. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of our troubles. Today, radio telescopes are used to study many kinds of objects, such as these strange ticking pulsars discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. For our 20th anniversary programme, she came into the studio to explain exactly how she did it. When I finally succeeded in getting this recording, uh, this is what it looked like. There's this pen recording here, and you can see that as the pen goes along, there are impulses, bursts of radio signal. In fact, they're equally spaced. They're not all there. There's the odd gap, but they are typically at this separation, yeah. which is one and one-third seconds. Suspiciously man-made, actually. When did you decide that they, were, they weren't man-made? Very quickly, because they went round the sky with the stars. They kept sidereal time which means that it had to be something going around literally with the stars. I suppose it might have been a satellite in a funny orbit, but we eliminated that. And it couldn't have been anything earthbound, except possibly other astronomers, because they're the only people who keep time with the stars. And, of course, um, with optical telescopes, you couldn't see anything there at all? No, not in the case of this one. This was the first confirmation that neutron stars exist. Now, these are fascinating stars. They're compressed by gravity to a tiny size, 
and they're really hovering on the brink of becoming black holes. And black holes could well be the powerhouses of quasars, which have been found to be immensely remote and superluminous, moving away from us at speeds nearing the velocity of light. It was an object which was known to be a radio source, that is a source of radio radiation, um, to be an extremely small source. It had very little size, and the identification was made, uh, funnily enough, by using the moon. As the moon slowly passed across the source, the radiation was cut off, and by knowing the precise time at which the moon cut across the object, we were able to get an accurate position. And this led, on comparison with an optical uh, plate, to a identification with this object, 3C273, the first quasar. Another branch of invisible astronomy is infrared. And here on Hawaii, we have UCIRT, United Kingdom Infrared Telescope which now, for the first time, is able to take pictures of infrared objects. This is a standard optical picture of the Orion Nebula. Over here is our infrared image. And in this picture, you can see to the north of the famous trapezium cluster, a group of very bright sources. These sources do not appear on the infrared picture. They are infrared objects. And this is the first time that such an infrared image has been taken. This result alone demonstrates the power of the new camera. Also in Hawaii, there's this, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, due to be officially opened by the Duke of Edinburgh in just three days' time. It will study objects at sub-millimeter wavelengths through a very special membrane. This is made of an interesting material. It's Teflon, the stuff that's used on frying pans, but in fact woven into a cloth-type material, which we can stress up so that it will stand winds up to the order of 80 kilometers an hour. The membrane itself also reflects most of the solar radiation, which would give us thermal problems. And on top of that, it lets through some 97% of the sub-millimeter wavelengths that we're looking for. So it enables us to work for some 24 hours a day, whereas most other telescopes can only work during the night for that reason. And so from here, one of the world's great international observatories. What better place to start a chapter on observatories? As I've said, I had my own observatory at Selsey, where things don't always go according to plan. Claiming things stuck. And that wasn't very successful. But we did better at Mount Palomar in California, the site of the 200-inch reflector, the largest fully satisfactory telescope in the world. Just look at it. To the lower right of your screen, you can see one of the astronomers walking out of the dome. And that gives you some idea of how big this telescope is. Far below me, over 50 feet below, is the great eye, the light-collecting mirror, which enabled men to see further into space than had ever been possible before. The tube isn't solid. That would cause problems because of air swirling around inside it. So this tube is a skeleton construction. If you go there, to the visitor centre, you will see that programme of ours being played as part of their exhibition. Telescopes come in many different designs. This one's on Mount Hopkins in Arizona, on the small-topped summit, which is a driver's nightmare to reach. With a conventional reflector, the light from the star, or whatever you're examining, is collected by a large mirror and brought to a focus where the image is formed. The MMT hasn't one mirror, it has six, each of them 72 inches in diameter. What happens is that each mirror acts independently, but the light from each is brought to the same point, so that only a single image is formed. The result of that is that the MMT is as powerful as it would be if it had a single mirror 176 inches in diameter. The observatory really is a kind of a super hut. And when the telescope moves in azimuth, the whole 500-ton observatory moves with it. And it's quite amazing how smooth that motion is. Britain, too, has major new telescopes. The Isaac Newton Telescope, now in its new home on the island of La Palma. We were privileged to be able to use it when it was being commissioned. Well, the first thing we can see is uh, the ring nebula on the Finder television. Let's uh, switch now to the IMT. Not quite centred. But let's uh, trim it up a little bit, uh, move the telescope around so that the ring nebula appears central. 
the integrated signal can be fed down into a digital memory and several of these signals can be uh, digitized and stacked on top of one another to make the picture even clearer. But we can uh, insert between the television camera and the ring different colored filters. Uh, the astronomer can, can uh, look through these different colors and, and pick out different colored bits of the ring, different bits of things that are interesting to him. So if we take these three separate images, stack them one on top of the other electronically, then that produces a color picture. And there it is, a colour video picture from an object well beyond the solar system. And that's something that no one's ever done before. I think this is the first time that anybody's taken a colour video picture of anything uh, outside of planet spectrum. The INT is still doing well. But here on La Palma, a new giant telescope is coming into full operation this year. This is the 165 inch, or 4.2 metre, William Herschel telescope the most modern and potentially the most exciting telescope in the world. I'm hoping for exciting research, I'm hoping for exciting scientific discoveries, but above all I'm hoping to see the flourishing international collaborations which we have on the other telescopes. I'm hoping to see them uh, prosper and uh, become fulfilled with this superb new instrument we have here. I hope you feel it's a, it's a suitable instrument to be uh, unveiling itself for your 30th anniversary. So here's the 165-inch mirror of the William Herschel telescope brought out specially for us to see. This mirror, and others like it, are going to tell us a great deal within the next few years. But in this program, I've been able to touch on only a few of the many aspects of astronomy that we've covered during the past 30 years. So let's turn now to our final chapter, which I've called a chapter of incidents. A very large incident, over 20,000 years ago, resulted in a giant dent in the desert. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona, a huge gaping hole in the ground over 4,000 feet across. Just look at it. It was made by a meteorite, a huge chunk of material, mainly iron, weighing probably a couple of hundred tons, that came from space and blasted out, leaving this hole in the desert that you can now see. And, you know, when you look down into the crater now, it seems so quiet and so peaceful, and it's rather hard to realize that for just a few seconds, more than 20,000 years ago, this was probably the most fearsome place on the entire surface of the Earth. For our 50th program, we'd planned a live look through a telescope, but we hadn't taken account of the weather. George, what do you think ah. of the prospects <clears throat> now at the moment? I think we're nearly totally obscured, Patrick. Do you think it's any good turning on to the direct general direction of the moon? Frankly, I don't think it is. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. Michael Benteen joined me for a chat about UFOs, and we found that we had some extra viewers. <laughs> well, I wonder, if we ever do contact other beings, are they going to be like us, or are they going to be entirely different? They're going to be the same kind of material, undoubtedly, so they won't really be bug-eyed monsters. But will they look like us? I don't see why they, sh uh, they shouldn't be humanoid. I mean, obviously, if there are extreme conditions, like the surface of uh, Saturn or the surface of Jupiter <laughs> or something, like the giant planets, they'd be squashed flat, you know, your ovoids, as you remember. But, um... I don't see why they shouldn't uh, resemble us. I really don't see why. Well, Fred, what do you think of the planet Earth? To be frank, old man, not very much. Neither do I. Have you seen any sign of intelligent life? Not a flicker. If we can see one star, we'll just get the telescope onto it and give you at least a direct picture of that. No, we no, are good. totally obscured. Well, <laughs> there's hope yet. We still have some, uh, we still have some I minutes. I can see old here. Can you? But it's gone again. <coughs> it goes before you can get near it. That wasn't the only occasion I had trouble with the weather. The observatory was established in 1896 by one of astronomy's great characters, Percival Lowell, because he thought, uh, correctly, that seeing conditions here would be excellent, um, despite the weather of the present moment. There is definitely a lightning over there now, George. Can you see it? It's coming out. Yes, there is the moon. I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. It's gone. And um, I had the pleasure to road test Roland Emmett's lunar cycle. Here we have three pumps. Now these are simply oxygen pumps of improved design. And as you will see, we have two pumps per passenger and one pump per puss. Next, we have the lunar boot. Now this has two functions. It can be used to plant the usual obligatory footprint upon the moon's surface, just in case the pilot is too tired to get out of his bicycle. So, from Brighton, where the sky, sky is now completely overcast, 
Good night. Good night. 